Hello, welcome to my video sample for my presentation on the topic of marketing. Now this is a topic that can be covered with a wide variety of audiences from the novice marketers to where this is sort of a training prop process to the more experienced marketers where we would skip over the basics and st stick, uh, skip straight to some of the lessons learned, some of the real world experiences, some of the new concepts. And I've organized this presentation on the board uh, similarly, like I'm, I'm just going to list some of the concepts that we cover just so that you know what is included, but I'm not going to go into too much detail here. This would be the kind of thing that you would do for a training session. And then I'm going to get to things like the mistakes, common mistakes and pitfalls at the end, which is a much more applications based, you know, this would be relevant for a room full of potentially professional marketers. And because I have a lot to say on this, I used to work specifically in this field, I can adjust um, not just the skill up based on the skill level, but also on the time available. I can do anything from a you know 20 minute presentation to really an all day intensive course. Um, I always like to start out talking about marketing by pointing out that there is uh, oftentimes marketing is about finding the right product or service for the customer. But I also always want to emphasize that it's just as important to identify and reach the customer. There are as many businesses fail because they fail to reach the customer as there are because they didn't get the right product or service or value proposition. So with that in mind, let's get started. Let's talk through some of the concepts. I always like to start out by just sort of defining how I think about marketing in relation to some other concepts because it gets thrown in oftentimes, people will say that, that you know, they're, they're looking to do marketing, but if you get to talking to them, what they're really doing is the sales. Or um, advertising, which is related to marketing, but is oftentimes treated as a different field. I've always been sort of amazed that there's such little emphasis on advertising in most formal business curricula. And I think the reason for that is it's sort of considered more of a creative art uh, than the science, which is uh, more the marketers consider themselves more of the, uh, uh, the quantifiers, the scientists. And then, of course, the promotion, which, and, and I, I put these markings here because these are all interrelated. So if you're doing a two for one sale, that is both, uh, you know, that might be uh, marketing in terms of the value proposition you're going for, you might be advertising it, or your direct sales force uh, might have to be out there um, promoting it accordingly. But these are all related, but they tend to be treated differently in business circles. When I talk about marketing, I'm talking specifically about determining what product or service you want, identifying which customer to reach, what channel to go through. It's less about, uh, it can get into value proposition, but it's less directly about uh, you know, going out and shaking hands and uh, coming up with a sales pitch. So th those, th those are interrelated, but they're often discussed differently. Now let's talk a little bit about, uh, in, in a regular training session, I talk about the, the P's and the C's. Um, these are just some textbook models. I'll skip over them quickly here, but like P's are things like determining the product price and promotion. The C's are things like the channel and the customer. And they're basically just a, a way of listing all of the topics relevant to marketing. Um, I like to emphasize more the value proposition. And the value proposition can be a variety of things. It can be, uh, it's effectively what you're offering the customer, what they're getting from your product or service. And that can be economic, you're saving them time or money. That can be uh, more hedonistic, you're uh, making something in their life beautiful, this is an artwork. Um, it can be something more st uh, status oriented, you're demonstrating your status or stature. It can be a luxury product. And frankly, those can all be related. For example, a car is something that can get you to work, which is effectively helping you make money. It can also be something that you are per personally passionate about, you enjoy driving, and it can also be a status symbol. So those aren't mutually exclusive. Also, the, um, you, the value proposition can be defined relative to your competitors. You can differentiate yourself this way. So for example, you say, well, we're the value brand, we offer you less features, but we do so at less price. So that's a less for less proposition. You can also have uh, uh, more for the same. Look, we're the same price as our competitors, but we give you more, uh, more features or, or services or better pro customer service. And you can also have things like a more for less, which is a great deal for the customer, but it's very expensive oftentimes to manage the fulfillment for. And uh, then finally, there's the value chain, which is sort of, uh, you know, if you look at the uh, raw materials to the manufacturers, let's say we're talking product, to the uh, distributor, to the manufacturer, to the distributor, to the retailer, to the end customer. Uh, we try and figure out how, uh, the, how much of that and, and what the economics are. We'll get to this in a, in a bit here. Um, where do I have economics? Uh, yeah, right here. 
but um, of the channel. But that's the value chain. So that's uh, so I'll, I'll end the value proposition on that. Moving on, you can talk about push versus pull marketing. Push meaning you have the channel or trying to push the product, the customer towards your particular brand, your product or services versus pull, which is where you're advertising and the customer or creating buzz and the customers come in to the uh, say retailer asking for your product. And that can be the difference between where you spend your money. You can spend it on advertising, which is essentially creating a pull, or you can spend it in the channel, which creates the push. The last point I want to talk about just in general concepts is the uh, way in which you determine customer input. You can do that through customer surveys or focus groups. I have some tips on those. Uh, there are several things that you might want to do uh, with that information. One of the most important ones is segment your customer base. And you can segment by several factors. You can segment it by product. The people who buy this card tend to want these features. You can do it by demography. Uh, you know, males between 18 and 34 tend to want something different than women between 55 and over. Uh, or you can do it by behavior. These are the people who are uh, seeking, or uh, there's also sort of needs related to, to behavior. These are the people who are seeking to just have functional products versus these are the people who are seeking status symbols, things like that. And generally speaking, I have listed these in an increasing order of importance. The product, um, if, you're, if you're segmenting your market by product, your customers by product, you're sort of assuming that there's already a product that they're looking for. And you want to actually, the higher level of thinking would be going after some of these ideas to define the product. And demography might be a little bit more specific than the product, but it's not as complicated as the behavior. So these are sort of increasing levels of sophistication. And there's a trade-off that you oftentimes make as you work your way through the marketing plan between uh, the price and difficulty of acquiring this customer input versus the, the quality of it and the sophistication of it. So those are some general concepts that we cover, especially in like a training program. Let's move on to, uh, I'm gonna put, talk about three major important things to marketing, brands, channels, and pricing, and then we'll get to sort of the application-based mistakes. So under brand, I start off with my shirt story. Um, we are oftentimes much more influenced by brands than we would admit or frankly even realize or like to uh, concede. There was an, a study done where they had people at, in, a, in a shopping center performing surveys, sort of stopping strangers, would you please take a survey? And the real test was they were wearing different shirts. They were all wearing shirts that were the same color and type of pattern, but some had a branded label on them and some didn't. And what they found is that people are significantly more likely to stop and participate in a survey if the person has a fashion branded shirt. And I don't think that that's something people would really realize. But I, I start off with that just to sort of show you the importance of brands. We know the explicit obvious ways, but there are all sorts of subtle motivations that we don't uh, necessarily recognize. So let's talk a little bit about some of the strategies and tools you have in branding. These are really sort of the branding choices. You can have a single brand, all of your products will be under the same uh, major brand and you will have, uh, because you want to, and all of your investment therefore co will cover all of your products. Or you can have a multi-brand. So if you have different behaviors or customer segments you're looking for, you might find that those brands are inconsistent. So for example, a car company might have both a luxury brand and a more utilitarian brand. So that's the single brand versus multi. And there's a trade-off there. Um, you also have the possibility of doing a co-branding. These are some hybrid arrangements like a co-branding, which is where you uh, combine the power of multiple brands. A good example of that is if you buy Crest toothpaste now, you can buy the Crest with scope uh, for the uh, breath freshener. So they combine both the Crest and the scope there. You can also have sub-brands. This is where you have a, a, a brand that is sort of considered a, a sub part of a larger brand and oftentimes a lower level, you know, a low versus high. So for example, I use the uh, Armani, the clothier. Uh, the Armani brand is like a very premium suit maker, but then they have the Armani Exchange, which is a lower end, more accessible brand. Their prices are much lower and the, the clothes are less uh, uh, complicated. And that's oftentimes a very difficult thing to manage. Oh, I have an example of when I was working in the printer industry and HP was being uh, chipped away at by le uh, cheaper printers, which I happen to be uh, employed by. But the, what they did is they brought out an Apollo brand, which was below the HP brand. But they really had a problem 
uh, branding it because if they put HP on it, people would buy the lower end rather than the higher end because you're getting an HP either way. But if you separate the brand, uh, then all of a sudden there's no value proposition in the lower brand because uh, they had to differentiate it from the more premium brand and they didn't have much of a value proposition because the challenger brands like the one I was working for were offering the same HP specs for less money. What was Apollo offering? Well, they couldn't make it the same specs for less money because they'd be competing with themselves, but they couldn't make it less specs for less money because they would be at a disadvantage versus the challenger brand. So there's a real fraught with uh, potential conflicts and, and uh, cannibalization as it's called there when you're making sub-branding decisions. Also there is the uh, private label brand or the no brand. These are like a generic. These can be done a couple of ways. Private label means that you are supplying other people who are able to put their own brand on it and this sort of gets into channels which we'll get to momentarily and the no brand uh, is either generic or it's a house br uh, it's a brand that is not effectively no brand because it's not considered premium you see a lot of this in the grocery business interestingly a lot of the private label brands the house brands the the generic store brand is uh, manufactured by, is by the brand leader because there's some economies of scale in it and they just don't uh, let them put the same formula or the same label on it. Uh, another example of branding tools as you can think about it is the challenger versus the leader. I gave you an example just a moment ago about the uh, uh, HP printer example. You can also think uh, there's a lot of different strategies that you would adopt as the challenger versus the leader. So for example, the challenger might want to um, def might want to define the performance of the product or service based on some benchmark, some comparable measure. So for example, whereas the leader might not, because they're the leader and they don't want to turn this into a specsmanship game, they call it specsmanship as in competing over specifications, because then the challenger can easily get the advantage. So if you look at the Brita filter uh, for the water, um, when pure filters came out, they said we take out 99 some percent of uh, impurities. Brita didn't want to compete on that level because then it would be 99.4 versus 99.5 versus 99.6, and they just kept it as taste. They kept it nebulous. Um, another example you might have is the economics of the leader uh, uh, might, might affect how they respond to a challenger. So for example, in my HP example, if they were a very large segment of the, of the uh, market and as a, as a small challengers, cheaper challengers came in, it didn't make sense for them to lower the price on virtually all of the market to take out a small uh, market share challenger. But as that challenger grew, all of a sudden, the, the, um, the amount of money they were willing to spend to put that challenger back down uh, increased and they were willing to compromise all of a sudden. So there's some economic considerations. Also under branding tools you have the, uh, I call it the just say no, or you have to learn how to say no to things. This is, um, oftentimes you'll be brought as a, as a marketer opportunities for deals, uh, different channels, maybe discounting and it'll move the needle and boost your sales, but you wanna consider how that affects your brand. For example, good luck finding a discount on Louis Vuitton handbags. Louis Vuitton will destroy their inventory before they discount, whereas other luxury brands might be more willing to do so. Um, and the reason for that is they want to preserve that premium brand, that aspirational cachet. They don't want, they, they think it's beneath their brand to be competing on price. And the last one I want to talk about here is the uh, question of who owns your brand. Uh, it's very common for marketing executives, confident marketing uh, people, ambitious perhaps uh, with uh, healthy egos, to think that they own the brand and they're going to tell the consumer uh, what, what the brand represents and because, because they're paying for the advertising. Um, what one of the executives at Coca-Cola once said is, you have to accept as a marketing executive that the customer owns the brand. It is up to them to de decide what it means to them and whether your message is consistent with that meaning. I actually have a little bit more, I think that's a great way of thinking about it just to sort of provoke some out of the box thinking, but I think of it really as a relationship. And because, you know, when you're in a relationship, you get to decide what the relationship means to me, to you, but you also have to uh, understand that the way the other person feels about it affects it as well. And you can't necessarily force yourself on to, to define the relationship as you want it, but neither do you have to fully accept it as that someone else defines it. 
So let's, that's uh, some information on branding, some concepts on branding. Let's talk a little bit more now about channels. And for those of you who don't know, channels is the, uh, essentially the path to market. How do, you, how do you sell to your customer? So you can sell directly. I go to uh, the website of the manufacturer and purchase the product directly or the service provider, or I can do it indirectly, which is means somebody manufactures the product and then sells it to a distributor who sells it to a retailer who sells it to a customer or, or uh, there's, there's no distributor. They take out the middleman and they sell direct to a retailer who sells it to you. I'm using product examples, but there's analogs to uh, services as well. And, and the direct versus indirect choice is a big uh, question that you have to uh, manage. And if you tend, and if you, uh, there are economic considerations for that. For example, if you're going direct, you don't have to pay your channel. But at the same time, you don't. You have to either expand the uh, availability yourself. You have to pay for the storefront uh, with a company-owned store. Again, using the product example, or you have to uh, uh, come up with a way to uh, reach your customers without going through a channel, without a retail store at all. Maybe a web presence. Now let's talk a little bit about some of the channel conflict. This is a classic example of what do you do when one channel uh, has an advantage in another one and you want to distribute in both. So some examples I will use here are where there's a co conflict in cost. For example, when HP was facing uh, Dell as a major competitor for PCs, they had a problem because their main channels, their volume went through retail stores like Best Buys. And they had to build the product and put it and ship it to the store and have it sit there in inventory. And then Dell came along and said, we'll just, we won't even make your PC until you order it. It's just, it's just gonna be parts of our suppliers until you order it, then we'll build it and send it to you directly. And they started to grow and HP, uh, Dell did, and HP had the problem of, look, we can't just go, uh, we're concerned that if we go direct, we will have a conflict with where all of our, essentially all of our current volume is with the Best Buys, they won't like that. But then if we don't go direct, we have to have all this inventory and we can't compete with uh, Dell on price because they have a cheaper model. So that's an example of the cost driving a, a channel conflict. Also, um, some online issues nowadays, we have the, the issue of showrooming, which is where I might go to Best Buy because they paid to put it in inventory and I see what I wanna buy, and then I go home and I order it directly online from someone who hasn't, uh, doesn't have a retail presence and doesn't have the, uh, the infrastructure costs and the inventory costs. And that's what gives the customer the best of both worlds. But if you're competing with that as a retailer or through a retail channel, that's the worst of both worlds for you. Also, there's the shipping and tax issue. Uh, you know, Best Buy, you won't have to pay for the shipping, but you will have to pay for the sales tax. Whereas if you buy from Amazon, uh, you do have to pay for the shipping and they oftentimes get around sales tax. That's, this is sort of an area in flux at the time of this recording. The shipping, however, um, you can buy for a fixed rate you can get free shipping on all of your Amazon purchases and that drives loyalty. That's one of their new propositions. So those are some issues on uh, channel conflict. Let's talk uh, also about the relationship. If you're, and I mean specifically here, the customer relationship. If you're working through a channel, you have a problem in that uh, they, the channel might own the relationship with the customer, whereas if you're going direct, you own the relationship with the customer. And so if you get into a feud uh, with your channel, they, can, they own the relationship, they'll just switch that customer over to a competing product or service. Whereas if you own the relationship, they won't be able to do that. And then lastly, uh, just the economics of channels. Uh, we talked a little bit about some of the economics with the PC example. Cla another example of this is in the grocery business where oftentimes manufacturers will pay the store for advertising and give them bonuses for selling more of their product. And what ends up happening is grocery is almost a real estate business. It's almost like the grocery store just builds the, uh, the location in the neighborhood and then the, uh, the retail, pardon me, the manufacturers and the suppliers pay them to lease that space so that the people can have availability of their product. So there's different economic models in channel as well. Now let's talk about pricing. Uh, first point I always like to make on pricing, uh, pricing is based on the willingness to pay, not the cost. It's a common, common confusion. Uh, it's, so for example, if you go to a movie theater and a Coke costs $5, it did not cost $4.80 worth of cost. It cost 
you know, a nickel, a dime, uh, but, but because you're there, you're willing to pay a premium. And so they take that money, rather than putting it in the cost of the product, that money is actually going towards the fact that they built this theater and the person who's working there and their profit margin comes out of that. And that brings me to my next point, which is different models have uh, cost uh, in, in the, the pricing structure. So for example, if you're doing a product or service, um, there, sometimes the cost is in the product or service. The, the, uh, you know, if you're buying something that has a manufacturing cost of $10 and they're charging you $12, obviously it goes into the product cost. But a good example of luxury goods, uh, a luxury goods serve a good example where the cost is not in the product but in the marketing. So high-end apparel, they're not, you're not paying with that price. You're not paying for the cost to make a garment. They're actually pretty inexpensive now. Uh, be, what you're paying mostly for is the marketing. They took out an ad in Vogue, and, and uh, the, the spirits industry works this way as well. Jack Daniels, there's more money in the Jack Daniels brand development in sales and marketing than there is in the actual uh, distilled, distilled grain, essentially. L l another issue on pricing is you gotta decide when and how to charge. This is very relevant to a lot of the uh, technology companies now because if you start charging early, the advantage is you have to use less of venture capital, but it creates a price, what's called a price umbrella, where now you're charging, somebody else can come in and with their venture capital funding undercut you by continuing to give it away for free and they can leapfrog ahead of you because people prefer the free service. The other question you have to ask is how do you charge? Do you charge the customer a subscription? Do you charge them uh, or, or do you charge advertising? Or do you charge for the information that you're selling about the customers that you gather? Those are still technology examples. Let me use a non-technology example. There is the uh, issue of newspapers, and they ran into big trouble because newspapers used to essentially charge, the how they charged was through the advertising and through the classified ads. And that would subsidize then the, uh, the cost was actually in, the, but the cost was in the news division and paying reporters to go to the courts and, and take notes and to, to write the story and do the interviews. And the problem is uh, pl places online like Craigslist came along and knocked out the classified advertising. So now newspapers are struggling because they still have the cost, but they've lost the revenue from where they used to gather it from. Uh, so that's when and how. You have to decide when and how to charge. You also have to decide what to charge. And that is really tricky because it's hard to determine ahead of time. Uh, for example, ask, you know, if it's an existing mature market, you can just look at the, the current value propositions. Um, but you could, if not, you're, you're, uh, you're sort of uh, in the dark a bit and you might have to do some of these customer surveys that we talked about trying to get customer input. And the problem is they don't have the same incentive to give you an honest answer. They always want to lowball you so they can save more money. How much would you pay for this? Well, you might find that their, their statements don't necessarily match their behaviors. Um, and, and also very important that is the ability to price discriminate. Sometimes you sell something and you sell it to everyone at the same price. But if you can get into an industry where you own the relationship directly and you can gather information about those people's behavior, you might find that some people are more willing to pay than others. And that's called price discrimination. Kind of an unfortunate term because discrimination has a negative connotation. In business, it's actually very valuable. And uh, let's, let's move on from that. I uh, also wanted to point out when you're deciding what to price, err on the side of pricing high because it's easier to lower price than it is to raise. Lower pricing people like because, hey, I'm getting a better deal. Raising prices uh, tends to aggravate people because, they're, hey, this was only worth some, something else. Yes, this was worth less yesterday. And there's also some pricing plateaus that you have to consider. One of them is uh, psychological plateaus, like that's just not, that's too much money, that's not worth it. I think the razor blade industry is facing this right now because uh, Gillette has added technology and more technology and more blades and more lubricating strips. And now they've gotten to the, and uh, up to a certain point people didn't care because they were really functionally better products. But now they've started, gotten so aggressive on the pricing, people are starting to consider opportunity, other opportunities. And like I said earlier, they, they now have a pricing umbrella that someone can undercut them with. And the last one is approval points. If you're doing a business to business, you're doing a direct sales, you're, you're negotiating contracts. Um, some people only have the, you know, I, anything over $10,000 I have to get my boss's approval for. So you charge $9,999. Or if it's $20,000, you break it up into two different payments of $9,999. So with that in mind, we've talked about some of the major issues. Uh, I've given you some samples, although there are more for a live presentation. Let's talk about some of the common mistakes. 
The number one mistake that I've seen in marketing is they neglect to consider the return on investment. You know, business is all about uh, the four major top things, which I talk about in my finance presentation. It's the investment, the return, the time it takes, and the risk that you assumed. And the problem is if you look at marketing measurements, the success for marketing is oftentimes things like unit volume, market share, uh, growth, and revenue. And you'll notice that none of these things are investment, return, time, and risk. And so the, oftentimes the, the motivations of marketing are disconnected from the true business rewards. And as a responsible manager, you gotta close that gap. One of the reasons I think it exists is because it can be hard to track. For example, if Coke buys a Super Bowl ad, how many incremental use, uh, units of Coke could, did they sell? It's very difficult to quantify something like that. And you oftentimes have to do some experimentation and isolate some geographies and, and do some uh, to try and figure out what moves the needle and what doesn't. Um, also, there's a common issue that because business doesn't always look at return on investment for marketing spend and mar advertising spend, the, the executives will game this system and will throw so much money and resources at a product or service that they're responsible for. And then when it grows share or grows unit volume, they'll say, look, I did a great job, but they've created a self-fulfilling prophecy by over-investing. Another common mistake, let's change uh, gear here a little bit. Um, very common to assume that you are the customer, you as the marketing manager or the business person. And it's important to point out that generally speaking, you have more knowledge of your product than your customer does because you deal with it all day every day and to them it might be kind of a minor issue um, and also you might have more passion about it because you are so interested you've dedicated your career to this and other people might not care I worked in the printer business as I mentioned earlier and we tried all sorts of things to make printers exciting and new and innovative and the truth is people really don't aren't that interested in thinking so much about their printers it's a lesson we learned the hard, expensive way. Also, another mistake is you always go after the large growing segment, whereas you would be better off in terms of profitability by isolating the most defensible segment where you have an advantage and where it doesn't make economic sense for other people to challenge you. Good example of this is the Dodge Ram truck that was redesigned in the early 90s. They went to a revolutionary new front end that looked like a, like a big rig, and it was very divisive. They, they did a survey that said, about 30% of the market really liked this and about 70% hated it. It was way too revolutionary for them. And so generally speaking, you know, why would you build a product that 70% of your target market uh, doesn't, uh, hates? Well, the reason is because Dodge only had about 10 or so percent market share. So 20 or 30% of the people who loved it passionately, that was actually a doubling or tripling of their unit of their share, of their unit volume. So they went ahead and did that. And it turns out it was actually, you know, people were just hesitant because it was new. It turned out it was actually closer to 50-50 who liked it and it's become a little bit more of the norm now. And then the last thing I want to talk about, I'm going to acknowledge some advertising. I can talk about advertising uh, in marketing and if it's something that the audience is interested in. I always say the mistakes you can make is you can have a funny ad, but people forget what the brand was. I mean, they're so interested. Oh, I love that lovable teddy bear who made the funny noises, uh, the wise cracking frog, but nobody remembers what they were actually advertising. You ran into this a little bit with uh, office superstores. The Staples, Office Max, Office Depot, they used to all be red and white by their corporate colors. Office Max has since changed. But what they would do is they would go out in the parking lot and ask people, what store did you just come out of? And they would say the wrong one. They'd say, oh, I just got out of Office Max, and it was Office Depot. And so what was happening is when Office Max did an advertising campaign, they were basically advertising for two of their competitors as well as themselves because people didn't really know the difference. So you don't want the brand to get lost. And then the last one is you want to make sure that even if they love the ad and they remember the brand, it still has to drive them to purchase. You're not in the, if you're in advertising, it's not just an entertainment business. It has to garner results. So anyway, that's a pretty good coverage of a pretty good idea of what I can talk about with marketing. I hope you've enjoyed this. If you'd like to have something presented like this at your organization or event, please contact me at keithwhite.com for a proposal. I look forward to doing business with you.